Hey, I'm Zach. Welcome to MNF Reps. Today I'm speaking with Jared White. He is the athletic director at IMG Academy, where he oversees staff management and daily operations for the athletic training, strength and conditioning, and nutrition departments, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but turns out it is. There's plenty that athletes and coaches of all levels can learn from his 15 years of experience, especially one super common yet destructive habit that many of us make when we hit an obstacle or setback on the field, in the gym, or at home. Huge thanks to Gatorade GX app for sponsoring this episode of MNF Reps. You can download the app right now on iOS. And guess what? It's free. Good to meet you, sir. Thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, good I appreciate to meet you. it. So what does an athletic director do? Can we start there? Yeah, so it's a little bit different here. You know, the athletic directors in the like the collegiate context, which would oversee essentially anything that has to do with the athletic department. They oversee the coaches, they oversee the support staff. Here at IMG Academy, we have a little bit different of setup where we do have athletics that's, that actually sits beside uh, what we do in athletic and personal development. And the athletic directors would oversee the sport directors and the sport coaches, whereas myself and my counterparts oversee basically our support staff. And so the athletic trainers, the strength and conditioning coaches, the nutritionists, the leadership coaches, the mental conditioning coaches, the sports scientists that all then provide that supplemental support to the sport. That's what we do here. And so it's pretty, pretty comprehensive effort, obviously, with, you know, over 1400 kids and all the other things that we do. Now, from your bio, it says you have roughly about 15 years experience in high school, college and at the professional level. Is there an area which you prefer? Do you prefer working with specific athletes at a specific stage? Yeah, it's interesting. There is a difference to a certain degree of the type of athletes you're working with. I would say my preference and types of athletes I work with are really just athletes that are motivated to do more than they're currently doing. And I think that that can happen at all levels. You know, I've seen that at the public school level. I've seen that at the private school level. I've seen that at division three level, the division two level, the division one level, obviously. But, yeah, you know, there, there are athletes. And the interesting part about what we do is we always say, look, I'm, I'm willing to work as hard as you are. To, to accomplish your goals. I mean, that's what we're here for. But, you know, the, the kids and the athletes that really put in the time and go above and beyond to really make themselves greater. And I mean, those, those are the ones that are super rewarding for us when we see an athlete, and especially from even a medical perspective, when you have an athlete that gets injured and is kind of back up against the wall and then is able to come back. And it's those sort of things that are awesome for us. I do want to circle back to that, the injury and rebounding phase, but at IMG Academy, I mean, look, it's an expensive place to go to school, and it's a very elite place. I've seen the statistics of how many people go on to the Olympics or things like that. Wouldn't the majority of athletes that are going there already be incredibly motivated to compete and do well? Or would you say that you still have the folks that maybe get there and they realize that maybe this isn't the direction they want to go and they kind of trail off? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's that sentiment probably everywhere you go in athletics, I mean, even the professional level, some guys get there and say like, yeah, yeah, this isn't, you know, this isn't really what I want to do anymore. The interesting part about IMG Academy is that we really incentivize, I mean, this high performance and it's kids from all over the spectrum. And I mean, we're, we're well known for the kids that, and the athletes that are high performers and, and they go on and do great things at division one levels or pro levels and things like that. But we also have kids that really just started playing a sport. And so I think hmm. that's the interesting part for me is to say, you know, and, and those kids are one, the, actually the ones that, that probably have a greater opportunity for growth. You know, the kids that aren't very skilled in their sport. And we're a developmental academy. And so what we pride ourselves in is regardless of where you fall on that spectrum is we can help you get to that next level. I think there is obviously some extra motivation. We are a for-profit business. And so the, the, you know, price tag on you coming in here. There's a lot of, a lot of incentive from your parents and we have highly motivated coaches around here, highly right. motivated support staff. So I think it's just surrounding the athlete with the holistic support that they need. And when everyone's as motivated, you know, as you are, I mean, that's a recipe for success. And I'll say this, I did take a postgraduate year and it was hands down the best thing I'd ever done because a, I got to, um, it being around folks that were really, really motivated, not even just in athletics, that helped as well. But academically, that was very, very beneficial. I credit that with actually kind of pulling me out of cheating my way through high school, not reading. And then I go to prep school and it was it was another completely different atmosphere. And then being on a 
a football field with people that were going D1 that were planning on having, you know, turning this into a career, it made you kind of up your game. So that's kind of why I asked that. So I do want to talk about the rehabilitation part of it, not just the physical, but also the mental, right? So somebody that's, you know, like super varsity blues, a dude that's like super good. Sorry for all these football references, but it's kind of all I got. Um, uh, So the, the superstar or the up and comer that's like doing incredible goes down with an injury and that's gotta affect them psychologically, right? So how do you balance that rehabbing them and building them back up to find their confidence and also like ensure that they're not going to go out and, you know, blow their knee out right away? Yeah. I mean, good question. It's pretty comprehensive answer, I would say. And and it's, it's multifaceted. I think the effect or the impact that a, that an injury has on an athlete varies from athlete to athlete. We obviously hate to see an athlete that gets, you know, a season ending injury or something that keeps them out for an extended period of time. But I think, I think the, one of the key things from a mental or psychological standpoint is just to keep that athlete as engaged as you can with the sport. And I think one of the things that athletes do that probably isn't intentional, it's kind of natural for us to go, you know, kind of seclude ourselves when we're, when we're hurt or we're going through something that going through a struggle or something that's not easy. But I think that's the worst thing that athletes can do. I mean, when you're in that situation where every day you're around this group of athletes and this group of coaches and you're pushing yourself and this is really your identity and then you have that identity taken from you, I think you still got to you still got to find a place where, you know, you, p- potentially it's a new identity for a temporary uh, period of time where, you know, you were maybe the the main contributor, say, we'll keep with the football references, but if I'm the stud running back and now I'm out and I can't score points anymore, what can I do then to help the team succeed? And I think the biggest thing there would be, what what's my impact in the film room? How can I help the next guy up? And how do I continue to develop for college? I mean, your point about taking a post-grad year, putting yourself in a position where, you know, I, I know I'm going to college soon and what credits can I go ahead and get out of the way? And those, so it's those sort of things. And then what we do here at, at IMG Academy is, we really have specialists in those areas. And so it's it's putting kids in a position where if they need the supplemental help and they need some one-on-one conversations to talk through what they're going through, I think that's extremely important. But we also have what we call an injured athlete program here. And so basically, if you're then pulled out of your sport and you're not going to be training on the field, we want to fill that time with something that could benefit you in the long run. And our goal is really to get you back stronger, faster, quicker than you were before you got injured. So we try to provide nutritional support, psychological support, some leadership support as well, some life skills as well, and just really take advantage of the time that you have now and capitalize on probably the things that you weren't spending a lot of time on before you got injured. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you part of your job is to serve as the medical lead for uh, the Academy's NFL Combine and NFL International Pathway programs. Mm-hmm. What are those and how like how rigorous are those? I mean, they they must be, you know, clearly if you were trying to pave the way at least for somebody to get into those. That's the pinnacle of 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 the sport, right? The NFL. So what is that program like? Do you, do you have to be selective in it? Do you draft people in it? How does it work? Yeah, so they're two completely different programs. And since COVID, we really haven't kickstarted our combine program back up yet. But essentially, both the programs are we get a group of guys in here and we have approximately three months with them. And our job with the combine group is really to get those guys prepared for the NFL combine. So we're doing speed speed testing, we're doing their jump testing, and then we're doing their sport specific testing as well. Really just to get them stronger as, as well, stronger, faster, quicker in the specifics of the things that we know they'll have to uh have to go through at the combine. And that also includes some interview prep. That also includes some mental conditioning and some of those things to just make them more, I guess, ready for the rigors of that NFL combine. I don't think many people understand this, but you know, when those guys go up there to Indianapolis for, they're there about three days, three, four days each. And I mean, it's, they don't get much sleep and they are busy. If they don't have something on their schedule, they're basically being interviewed by teams. And so it is a nonstop for three days and obviously like the biggest three day interview of their lives. So, so we try to prepare them as best we can. We do a mock combine where we take them through all the drills and we do mock interviews with our coaches and our staff. And so really cool program. It's cool to see how they grow uh, through the program. And then the international pathway program is one that we'll, we'll start back up in January here, but Very interesting program. It's basically a talent transfer portal. And so what what the NFL looks to do is to bring international athletes that may or may not have experience with American football. In fact, a good majority of them 
don't to a good degree. And we basically have three months with them. And then the NFL allocates four spots um, in a certain division every year for a practice squad exemption for this international player pathway. We have a guy now, Jordan Mailata, who's a starting left tackle for the Eagles, who came here. We started off in January. He didn't know how to put a football helmet on. And then he got drafted by the Eagles three months later. So <laughs> the, the amount of growth that those athletes can have in a three-month period is unbelievable. And it really showcases everything we do here. So those programs really bring together our entire department for, for that holistic approach to athlete well-being and performance. Yeah, it reminds me of Brock Lesnar going from uh, amateur wrestling. Did he jump into MMA and then wins uh, the championship like on his first fight or something? It's like yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. But that's that's I guess that just speaks to the talent and that certain people possess, or maybe it's their drive. It's probably a hybrid. You were also head athletic trainer in the NCAA and also AFL, which is the Australian Football League. Is that rugby? Is that soccer? Is that American football. League. So there is an AFL Australian football league, which, which one of my colleagues was a coach in that was actually arena football league for me. So I was in the, when okay. the arena league when AF one was around, I was in Kansas city and was a head athletic trainer for the Kansas city brigade at the time. And so that was a really, really interesting experience for me. I had an opportunity to, to work with the chiefs before that, and then went straight over and they needed some help over in, in the arena league. And so I jumped over and did that. That was my first experience as being a head of a department and, uh, Really interesting experience. I mean, that game is is so fast and it's, yeah. you know, it's football, but with walls and, uh, you know, you can kick it off the nets. And it's 80 yards, really, right? Is it 80 yard, 80 yard field? Yeah, it's not, I think it's with 80 yard, 80 yeah. yard field. But yeah, it was really interesting. Really good guys. I mean, that group of guys is just a group that kind of had a chip on their shoulder from either they had played in the NFL or they, you know, just had kind of fallen a little bit short and really had something to prove. So a really good opportunity for me. I mean, we got to travel to a lot of the big cities and, and play in some, you know, some pretty cool places. And obviously from a football standpoint, I've been to a lot of football stadiums, but we got to play in the Staples Center and we got to go play in, wow. you know, Philadelphia. And so it was really cool, really cool That's experience. Cool. Basically what I was trying to get to is with all your experience, is there anything that you see that maybe mentally or emotionally that athletes share at all levels? Meaning like if someone's struggling, is there a strategy that you know that's like a go-to? Because I understand it's not... Obviously, people have diverse backgrounds, and no one came up the same. And no, no one size fits all here. So, what is the strategy? How do you kind of sit back and and think about or figure out what to do to pull these people out of ruts? Because especially at the high school level, right? There's a lot of things happening from a social standpoint. Maybe you're in a relationship and it ends, and it's like devastating, and it's like you have to still stay focused. So, how is do you take that into account when you're dealing with students and student athletes? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is, I kind of alluded to it before, but I think a lot of people, our natural tendency is to dig a hole and, and just kind of sit back and, and stay away from people. And I think that's one of the worst things we can do. I think one of the things we encourage our athletes to do is just, you know, be honest about what's going on. And I think one of the most powerful things you can do when you're stuck in a rut like that, and this is athletically or otherwise, is right. to put a group of people around you that can help you, can help you out of it. Because I mean, we're so much stronger with a group of people around us. And so uh, I think the, you know, the athletic stigma, a lot of times of those of us that have played, you know, sports all our lives and things like that, we have, we have egos and it's, it's kind of macho to, you know, to, I've got it, I can figure it out. And I think, Man, that's where we see athletes really struggle. And so, yeah, I think it's really identifying the key indicators of certain behaviors. And so I think, why is this happening? And again, we can look at injury and say, you know, that doesn't just happen because somebody had a trauma. It could have a lot of other things to do with it. And so I think, yeah, it's identifying those things that are going on here. Here, it's a very interesting dynamic, as you can imagine, with our demographic. We've got kids, adolescent kids that are essentially in a college atmosphere without their parents. And so... You know, that that plays a huge role in a lot of things. We have a lot of kids that are homesick and a lot of kids mm -hmm. that are without the sitting around the kitchen table at night getting advice from mom and dad. So a lot of our staff fill in that gap. And so I think it's really interesting. We do meet very often on what athletes are having challenges and how can we help support them. And then it's really just communicating that with the right people on campus. And like I said, some people need a ton of help. And some people, you know, just need to check on them every now and then. But yeah, I think it's really, really important to understand the whole picture uh, before, you know, prescribing something. I think a lot of times we jump in to action maybe too quickly with somebody who who's struggling without understanding the full picture. And is that something that's changed throughout the years? I feel like decades ago, it was more puff your chest out, don't admit anything, you know, plow through it. Where now, maybe it's just because, I don't know, maybe the information's out there easier, but we know that keeping stuff like that bottled up or keeping 
issues bottled up doesn't benefit anybody. It actually makes it worse. So uh, that's interesting because the coaches I had, even throughout college, I don't think that they went to any extent. And this, this is uh, opening my eyes years later. They didn't really go to any extent to try to understand what people were going through. They were just like, do this. Here's what you got to do. The only time I had that support, I think, was probably at prep school. So, and I, that was the first time out of like, you know, however many years that I, that I had that. And it was weird because I never had a coach as a mentor. You know, I never thought of that, a coach as a, a mentor or as someone I could look up to. It was just a coach. So is it important that you try to establish that type of relationship or is it just you're going to do your job and hope like you'll be there for the student. Hopefully they, they kind of create that bond, but if not, you just got to keep pushing. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you're, you're spot on where historically, and, and I, I would contribute, my theory is that there was just, there's a lack of knowledge um, around what actually exists, what actually helps. And a lot of people, I mean, still to this day, you know, again, the macho coach is just going to say, I know what I know and I know it works. What we found though, and what the research shows is, man, it is really important to, to take more of a holistic approach to well-being. And so I think nowadays there's so much education out there, I mean, especially online, uh, through podcasts and through tutorials and through rich articles and just anything online that there's so many resources for coaches and athletes now to get the help they need, you know? And I mean, there, there's even resources for online live help counseling for people that are struggling with things. And so I think now in this technological era, I think it's really important to use those to our advantage. And I think coaches now, no disrespect to any coaches out there that I just think it's ignorant if you don't uh, challenge yourself to, to grow your knowledge of of athletic well-being and and uh, and how we can support our athletes, it's great to know the X's and O's, and obviously that's the most important thing when you're talking about, especially at the pro level. We talk about wins and losses, but man, if you don't have that comprehensive outlook on how you're taking care of the athlete, we always say here the old cliche: it's no, they don't they don't care what you know till they know that you care. And so, I think that's absolutely true. And we would, if you date back to athletes that have had good success, and say. Yeah, I've had some coaches that pushed me, but also, man, the, the people that had the biggest impact on my lives were the ones that stopped and listened to actually what was going on. Yeah. Now, part of the job, as you said, being a for-profit institution is that you have budgets and you have to decide and figure out, it was probably a team effort, but I'm sure you have a huge say, if not the final say, in where these monies go. How do you figure out which goals, your growth goals, or how to implement organization or infrastructure improvements or whatever to the specific sport because I mean not everybody it's not it's not like you can just spread it evenly right because certain sports or certain things are going to bring in more revenue and they're also going if, if they're working you want to invest in them while the ones that aren't working you want to either either not take away from it but retool it maybe so how do you figure that part out is it just spreadsheets and uh, <laughs> that type of excel and all that stuff or, or is it something deeper yeah, I mean, there's, you know, obviously spreadsheets is a big part of it, but, uh, you know, we have a, we have a process where it, I mean, it, it just factors in, basically we start with the needs analysis, you know, what, what do we need? Obviously we sprinkle in what do we want on top of that. And then basically what we do is we present that to different entities on campus and, and work our way up and ultimately it sits with finance, you know, as a budget concern, but we'll basically go and then we just prioritize based on, we try to have a three-year plan and, and where do we want to be in three years? And then how can we objectively get there? And so we look at the things that, is this really going to help us get to our goal or is it not? Will we then prioritize those things and then essentially propose that? They'll come back and say, hey, we have the money for it likely or we don't. And then we'll just kind of continue to, to reassess, prioritizing like this is a this is a have to have versus this is a kind of a want to have scenario. And so I think it's, it's just, yeah, it's continual, obviously. And, and the thing that's cool about IMG Academy is it, it's constantly growing. It's constantly moving. It's constantly morphing. And so those needs do change. I mean, those needs can change within a few months. And so uh, one of the biggest, I think, tasks that we have is, is being able to forecast what's going to happen down the road. And so, you know, I think that's it's really important part of athletics. I think when you have people that are looking down the road, then you can allow the coaches and, and the athletes to really focus on the day and what they need to do in that day, as long as we're, we're resourcing them appropriately. But, you know, it's looking at the growth, um, 
of how many kids we're going to have. We also have to look at, as you mentioned, we have other external programs that come in. And so how are we going to best support those programs? And then as technology comes along and needs to advance, we've got to look at continually stay on top of those things as well. So we have people that basically that's their job is to, to, to come in and look at innovation and how can we incorporate it here. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, it's what's going to make the biggest impact on the athletes and their experience here and how can we help them achieve their goals. I want to go to IMG Academy, we'll say. Mm -hmm. What's some advice that you'd offer to me or some elite school? Like, and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm maximizing my talents. I want to be an NFL player. I want to be a pitcher. I want to, but it's also like there is that academic component. Do a lot of younger kids overlook that? And they need to understand that having that knowledge is just as important as being able to throw a ball. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And I think, obviously, there are some athletes that can just get by on their God-given ability. And, uh, you know, they make it and they're successful. Those, those right. athletes, few and far between. Few and far you between, know, right. Those are the ones that we, we like to emulate. But, man, the, the reality of it is the majority of youth athletes that want to play at a high level um, are really going to have to put in the work, not just on the court or the field, but, but in the classroom as well. And, again, you know, I reference there's so many tools out there now to help to help athletes. We have an online platform that that allows athletes to communicate with coaches and learn what are the prerequisites to get into school and how can I kind of get ahead. And so I think the biggest thing for athletes now is is putting the effort in on the school side as well, as you, as you were kind of referencing. I think they have to understand that that is a big part of it. As we all have, have played sports growing up, I think it's sports end at some point. And so that's the conversation that has to happen. It's like, this is going to be over at some point. And then what? And I think, yeah. I think nowadays people are thinking about that a lot more. And there are a lot, of, a lot more opportunities out there for kids to do. You know, it's not that you just have to have a, a huge college degree and go to med school and do all this to, to make good money or to be successful. Nowadays, there's so many different options. So, yeah, so I think, I think that's really important. And then I think one of the things that's always stuck with me, I think Kobe Bryant said it. But he, he talked about doing the things that, that others aren't willing to do. That's what helps you achieve greatness. I think that goes both ways. I think it goes in the, on, the, on the court and the field, but I also think it goes in the classroom. And man, if you are out there pursuing, uh, that's the biggest thing for us is, man, when you want to go to these big schools, if you want to like reach out and show interest and, and do the things that other kids aren't doing, just because you're a talented athlete, don't wait for people to come hand something to you. I think it's more of yeah. that pursuit of excellence has to be there and it has to, you know, people will work as hard as you will, uh, but man, you've really got to be able to promote yourself and sell yourself and, uh, and do the work on your own. And that's what really, that's what coaches are looking for now are the kids that can can come in or self starters and, and really want it. You know, I mean, I, we, we can talk about what Dion just talked about at Colorado. I mean, he wants kids that are, that are, that are self starters and come in there and just will work hard. Well, I think that's, that leads into another question I had, which is how do you become a self starter? So some people aren't maybe born with that get up and go and maybe they want to, and they don't know where to start. How do they change those habits? Well, I think one of, one of the most positive things about this environment here is that it's almost forced upon you to be around people who are self-starters. And so I think to your point, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people who are maybe more of a laid back personality or, or not as social or, you know, just a little more timid, not as motivated even. I think it's really important to put yourself around a group of people that will naturally draw you out of your comfort zone and get you into things that uh, that you, you really want to be involved in, but otherwise probably wouldn't. And so I think it's really important to stretch yourself. And a lot, a lot of us, I mean, look, one of my favorite quotes is everything you want's on the other side of fear. And I think that's a lot of us just get hamstrung by the, by the fear we have in our lives of, oh, there's no way I could do this. Or if I put myself out there, I might fail. One thing we've seen here and we see it every day is when you surround yourself with a group of highly motivated people, the outcome of that is way greater than you ever thought it could be. And so, you know, my advice to anybody is to, to find some find some folks in your gym, find some folks, you know, at your school, in your classroom, find some folks in your neighborhood. But, you know, somebody that you would emulate that you would say, like, man, when I'm when I'm there, I want it. That's that's exactly what I want it to look like. And just spend time with them. Ask questions. A lot of it's on you, even if you're not willing to really just go out there and, and be super aggressive in, you know, in the market currently, as we would say, I think it's just take the first step, ask questions, ask somebody to kind of mentor you and, and uh, how did they get to the success that they have? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting too that failure is such a big part of success and, uh, and probably at all levels, but specifically when you're younger, it can feel 
so devastating and it can feel like the world is collapsing on you because you failed at something. How do you go about explaining that to the folks? Is it an emotional attachment or is it an ego thing? What is it that makes people focus so hard on that failure and not understand? I'm talking about the folks that carry it with them rather than the folks that are like, okay, losing sucks. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it stings. I'm going to take some time to process it, but then I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to come back and I'm not going to make the same mistakes. But other folks can't let it go. So how do you get to that point? Yeah, I mean, I would obviously rely on our mental conditioning experts to, from the mental aspect of it. But I, I think the biggest thing from our standpoint, more of a physical development side, is you got to really understand your outcomes. Like, what are we trying to accomplish here? It's the kids are trying to get in college, you know. So you win, you're going to win some games, you're going to lose some games, but ultimately, are you becoming a better athlete? Are you learning more? Are you going to be more successful as you continue to grow in this journey? I think it's the same thing. You know, at the pro level, obviously, it's a little bit different. It is, is all wins and losses. And so uh, I think for those athletes, it's like, yeah, we've just got to learn from our mistakes and not let it happen again. Because again, our outcome is winning and we're not doing that. So how can we reflect on things? But we can't carry it with us because, I mean, you see that, you know, there's several teams now that are struggling in the NFL even. And you can just kind of see that they're just wearing it and uh, don't know how to get out of it. And I think that's, uh, again, that's the worst thing you can do is is moving on. Going back to surrounding yourself with the right people. I think when you surround yourself with people who've been through been through some struggles and been through the fire and, and, and can attest to like, you know, look, this is, you, you can't hold this. This is just going to hold you back. If your outcome is being, you know, a high high performing athlete, you've got to let it go and you're going to hold yourself back. And and there's enough, you know, there's enough, enough obstacles out there in the world to, to hinder people from accomplishing what they want to accomplish, but you can't be your own deterrent. And many people are to your point. And so I think it's just that realization. It's like, you know, surrounding yourself with people. I think many times we get, we get caught in our own head. And uh, when you have somebody outside of your head that can give you a different perspective and say, Hey man, you know, this is, this is not the way to do it. Let me help you and people that really care. I think that's that's the most important thing. Hey man, I, I wanna thank you for your time today. That's all I got for you. I'm super appreciative and I'm, I'm grateful for the insight. Where can people find you on social media if you do that type of thing or do they check out the IMG Academy? Any specific place you want people to either find you or what you're putting out there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm uh, obviously the, the IMG Academy website, my bio and, and some of my contact info. I, I'm not super active on social media, but uh, obviously I have a Twitter profile, underscore the Jared White, and also have LinkedIn bio. So I'm happy to answer questions. I, I love getting into, you know, conversations about performance and, and innovation and how we can continue to drive performance, particularly in, in high performance environments. And so, yeah, any, any way anybody can reach out to me, I'm happy to connect and no, I appreciate the time and enjoy the conversation for sure. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks again and uh, have a great weekend, sir. All right. You as well. I want to thank Jared for taking time to speak with me today. And a big thanks to IMG Academy and the folks at Gatorade's GX app. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to let my totally realistic sounding AI voice finish this video out. Please like, share, comment, or subscribe. All four would be nice, but one will do. Zero will make me cry. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs>